Hi everyone, welcome to Save Your Spot. It's story time. Today's story is called The Silver Whistle. So get comfy, get ready, and let's start our story. <laughs> Today's story is called The Silver Whistle. It's uh, the third story from our book, The Practical Princess and Other Liberating Fairy Tales, from, um, written by Jay Williams and illustrated by Rick Schreider. I can never say that properly. The Silver Whistle. The wise woman of the West had a daughter whose name was Prudence. She was a cheerful girl, as wise as her name, and as plain as the day is long. She had a snub nose, a wide mouth, straight, straw-coloured hair, and so many freckles that it looked as if someone had sprinkled her with cinnamon. When the time came for the wise woman of the West to die, she called her daughter to her and said, my dear, you must go out and make your way in the world. I can do nothing about your looks, but you have a merry heart and a lively mind, and there are plenty of people who like freckles. All that I have to give you is this silver whistle. If you blow it once, the birds will come to your call. If you blow it twice, the insects will be your friends. If you blow it three times, the beasts will speak to you. Thus, you will never be lonely. Suppose I were to blow it four times, asked Prudence. Try not to, said her mother gravely, for if you do, it will make a sound shrill enough to shatter glass and the whistle will be broken. So off Prudence went to make her way in the world with nothing but the clothes on her back and the silver whistle in her pocket. She travelled for many a day and many a mile and at last she came to a house that stood on four legs in the middle of a wood. The house turned round to face her and out came an old witch. She was as dry as a winter leaf and had only a few brown teeth. What do you want? she said. I am making my way in the world, said Prudence. Have you any work for me? Plenty of work, <laughs> cackled the witch. And a silver penny on the first day of every month, if you do whatever I ask. I don't mind, said Prudence. It will make a nice change. She became the witch's servant. And if the work was hard, it was also interesting. For the witch did magic from morning to night and there was always plenty of visitors. Whenever Prudence was lonely, she blew her whistle and talked to a bird, a bee, or a beast. One day, a messenger from the king came through the forest. He had a proclamation which had been commanded to read in every corner of the kingdom. It said, On the 31st day of May, Prince Pertinel is to be married. Therefore, all the maidens of the land are to come to the palace so that the prince may choose the one who suits him best to be his bride. Signed, King Quither V. Very good, said the witch. I have a mind to be, cho I have a mind to be chosen. For there is nothing I'd like better than to be a princess and someday queen. Dear me, 
<laughs> said Prudence, and she couldn't help chuckling. It seems to me that you would have even less of a chance than I, for if I am plain, you are perfectly hideous. So you think, retorted the witch, but with a magical mirror of Morna, I will win the prince's heart. For whoever looks into that mirror becomes more beautiful than the dawn of a spring morning. The spell lasts lasts as long as the mirror lasts and that will be long enough for me. And have you the mirror of Morna? asked Prudence. No, said the witch, but you are going to get it for me. I am? Where is it and how shall I get it? It is kept in the treasure house of the Warzor, the witch said. And if I don't know how you are going to get it, but however you get it, it must be given to you freely or its magic will not work. That doesn't make things any easier, murmured Prudence. Where is the treasure house of the wars or? I don't know that either, said the witch. All I know is that it is far to the south in a land where the trees have leaves but no branches and where the ground moves when the wind blows. I have never heard of such a place, Prudence said. Well, are you going? I don't mind, said Prudence. It will make a nice change. She packed a loaf of bread and a piece of cheese in her handkerchief and put her silver whistle in her pocket. Then she said to the witch, by the way, what exactly is a wazzle? Nobody knows, said the witch. I wish you luck. Off went Prudence, travelling south under the great trees of the forest. She wandered for many days. She was chilled by the wind and lay wet by the rain. Sometimes she rested at the inns or the cottages of farmers. Sometimes she ate nothing but dry bread for her dinner and slept on the hard ground. Whenever she felt lonely, she blew her whistle and talked to a bird, a bee or a beast. She remained as cheerful as she could and journeyed on looking for a land where the trees had leaves but no branches and where the ground moved when the wind blew. After a time, she climbed a steep mountain and came down its other side into a wide plain. The sun blazed overhead. There were tall trees with rough scaly trunks and from their tree tops grew large graceful leaves like bunches of feathers. Underfoot, the ground was soft sand, and when the wind blew, the sand stirred and shifted. <coughs> ah, said Prudence, this must be the land of the Warsaw. Not far away was a magnificent palace built of white marble. There were, were a thousand windows in its high walls from a hundred spires and domes flew banners of red and gold. Prudence walked to the palace and stood before the gates. They were wide open. I suppose that means I can go in, she said. She entered and found herself in a large hall. It was splendidly furnished but everything was covered with dust. Spider webs hung from the ceilings. No servant came forward and no guard stopped her. All was empty, silent and dirty. She passed through it into a corridor. She found a number of fine rooms and all were as empty and as untended as the first. In the last room, 
seated on a chair, studded with diamonds, was a fat moon-faced man. He wore a tall red hat with a diamond on the front of it. His robes were embroidered with gold threads. Although the chair didn't look very comfortable, he was sound asleep with his hands clasped on his round stomach. Prudence cleared her throat. Good day, she said. He opened one eye and then the other. I am looking for the warzel, she said. Then you can stop looking and go away, said the man, closing his eyes again. Why do they call you the warzel? asked Prudence. His eyes snapped open and he sat up. <coughs> because I am the only one there is, he answered. Why do you want to know? I'm curious. What is a warzel? I am, of course. And now that we're asking questions, who are you and what are you doing here? Prudence decided it might be better to say nothing about the mirror until she found out a bit more about the warzel. My name is Prudence and I'm making my way through the world, said she. The warzel stroked his ginger coloured whiskers. Mm, he said, don't suppose you're looking for a job, are you? All my servants have run off and left me. I don't mind, said Prudence. It will make a nice change. Why did your servants leave you? It is surprising, isn't it? said the warzel. I am one of the kindest, most generous men imaginable. I suppose they were frightened because my neighbour, Arbrook the Unpleasant, has threatened to destroy me. Why should he do that? Well, said the warzer, we warzers, as you know, are fond of diamonds. And since I am the only warzer there is, I'm even fonder of them than anyone. I stole a tiny little diamond from Arborg. It only weighed about 40 pounds. And when he demanded it back, I told him in the quietest and friendliest way that he was a thick-headed, pig-snouted, ring-tailed gutter snipe. For some reason, he became angry and put a curse on me. I see, said Prudence. When does he plan to destroy you? Tonight, said the warzel gloomily. And I haven't even had my dinner. Goodness, said Prudence, it doesn't sound as though a job with you would last very long. If you will work for me until sunrise tomorrow, said the warzel, and help me to escape from Arbor's curse, I will give you whatever you wish for my treasure house. However, he added quickly, you must let me choose what it will be. Prudence laughed. <laughs> Okay, very well, she said. What do you want me to do first? First of all, said the warzel, folding his hands over his stomach again, clean up this palace. It's a mess. Prudence looked around for a broom. Oh, I forgot to mention, said the warzel, that part of the curse Ardborg put me on was, uh, sorry, put on me was that here no broom will sweep and no mop will mop. And now you better get busy. For a moment, Prudence stood just thinking. Then she took out her silver whistle and blew a blast on it. In a twinkling, the air was full of birds. Hundreds and thousands of them came, flapping and chirping. Their wings blew the, the dust away. The larger birds picked up the bigger, bir the bigger bits of rubbish, 
the smaller ones took grains of dirt or spider webs. Then they flew off. And when they had gone, the palace was clean. The warzel pointed to one feather which remained on the floor. Not very neat, he said, and the noise of the birds has given me a headache. Now I'd like some dinner. He led Prudence to the kitchen, but before she could begin to cook, it grew dark. It was not the darkest of nights, but a deeper darkness, as if every light everywhere in the world had been blown out. The wizard's, the warzel's teeth could be heard chattering. I can't bear this, he groaned. Do something! Prudence tried to light a candle, but although it flamed up, it gave off only a tiny blow, like the faint glimmer of a distant star. I forgot to tell you, said the warzel, that part of the curse Arbrog put on me was that when the darkness comes, no lamp nor light will give any light. Prudence took out her silver whistle and blew two blasts on it. At once, millions of fireflies came from the desert. They swarmed in at the windows and hung in clusters in the air. All their shining bodies together were like a bright moonlight. Prudence soon had a fire going in the stove and was able to cook a fine stew. The warzel wrapped his robe around him, sat down at the kitchen table and ate with a hearty appetite. It's not exactly what I'm used to, he complained. I would have preferred roast pheasant, sugared rose petals and champagne. However, I suppose this is the best you can do. Prudence thought she could understand why all his servants had left him. She said nothing, however, but helped herself to some stew. <coughs> then it began to grow cold. Frost formed on the windows and walls. Icicles hung glittering in the rafters and the flames of the fire in the stove froze and stood fixed as they were made of yellow glass. I forgot to tell you, whispered the warzel, the part of the curse that Arbrog put on me was that when the cold comes, no flame nor fire will warm me. This is the end. Goodbye. Nonsense, said Prudence. You hired me to save you and that's what I intend to do. She took out her silver whistle and blew three blasts on it. In at the door bounded a lion. The lion uttered a roar and out by the other door bounded the warzor. The lion ran after him. All through the palace they went in one room and out the other, upstairs and down. Every time the walls all stop to catch his breath. his robe and his cheeks were redder than his hat. When at last the sun rose, he was thinner than he had been, but warm and alive. Now, said Prudence, it is sunrise and I have done as you asked. That's true, said the wizard, but I have lost ten pounds and I've had no sleep. However, I forgive you for as I told you, I am a kind and generous man, come along with me to my treasure house. The treasure house was heaped high with the warzel's collection of diamonds. 
diamonds of all shapes, colours and sizes lay there in dazzling heaps. Prudence looked thoughtfully at a very fine green diamond which was about the size of St Bernard's dog. The warzor looked pale. Before he could speak, Prudence said, You were quite right when you said that you wanted to choose what I should take. All these diamonds are too big and too heavy. Pick something that will do for a girl like me. The warzor sighed with relief. <sighs> Climbing a ladder to the topmost shelf, he took down a plain, simple mirror of ivory. This is the magical mirror of Morna, he said, blowing the dust off it. It is said to make people beautiful. It is no use to me, as I'm already as beautiful as possible, but it might do you some good. You are right, said Prudence. Do you give it to me freely? Absolutely, said the Warzor and he pushed her out of the door and locked it behind him with 17 keys. Prudence started for home. When she had gone a mile or two, she thought, perhaps I might just take a peep into the mirror and see if it makes me beautiful. She was beginning to unwrap it and then she laughed. I don't think I want to be beautiful, she said. I might be different outside, but I'll be the same inside. And I'm used to me the way I am. Anyway, I don't own the mirror, for I only got it for the witch. So she wrapped it up again and went on her way as cheerfully as ever. When she came at last to the witch's house, it was the 31st of May. The witch came out screeching with impatience, and with impatience, and even the house hopped from foot to foot. High time you returned, you lazy thing! She screamed. Bring the mirror and follow me. We must hurry to the king's palace. The city was full of girls. Smiling, they went in through the front door of the palace. Sadly, they filed out through the back door. When Prudence and the witch arrived, there were only a few girls waiting to enter, for it was nearly evening. At the door of the palace, the witch held out her hand, and Prudence gave her the mirror. The witch gazed into it. Instantly, she straightened and grew taller. Her white hair turned to gold. Her face changed and she became so beautiful that all the birds began to sing as if it were the dawn of a spring morning. Into the palace she went, with Prudence behind her. There sat the king and queen and before them stood Prince Pertinel. He was a tall, handsome young man, but pale with weariness and his eyes were glazed from the sight of so many ma maidens. Prudence looked at the witch and then she looked, sorry, Prudence looked at the prince and then she looked at the witch. Although the witch's face was lovely, her eyes had not changed. They were old and how hard and full of witchcraft. She was different outside but the same inside. He must not marry her, Prudence said to herself. If some day she becomes queen, she will be full of wickedness. There was no help for it. Do you know what she did? That's right. With a sigh, Prudence took out her silver whistle and blew four blasts on it. With the last note, the whistle split in two, but the mirror cracked with a loud noise and shattered to bits. And as the pieces clattered to the floor, 
the witch changed again into her own shape. With a screech of rage, <coughs> she flew straight up into the air and vanished through the ceiling, leaving a large and untidy hole in the plaster. <coughs> Prince Pertinel stepped forward and took Prudence by the hand. Marvellous, he said, you are the girl for me. Prudence stared at him in surprise. <coughs> me? But I'm not beautiful, she said. The prince smiled. That is true, he said. But I never said I would choose the most beautiful girl in the kingdom. I only said I would choose the one who suited me best. And as it happens, I prefer freckles. Will you marry me? Oh well, I don't mind, said Prudence, returning his smile. It will make a nice change. I hope you enjoyed it. Stay tuned for another story. The next one in this book is called Forgetful Fred. So if you enjoyed it, subscribe for more and bye-bye. Um,